Hello and welcome to episode 329 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. This show will air on Monday, December 20th. That's nine days before the February LSAT registration deadline. Um, it's already past the January LSAT registration deadline, but that's going to happen the week of January 15th. Uh, I want to invite everybody to my January 2021 LSAT study group. You don't have to be registered for the January test to come to that. All you need is a free demon account. Uh, just go to LSATdemon.com, sign up for a free account, and you can come talk to me. And uh, it's a really enjoyable class to teach because we get all kinds of new folks and continuing folks. You'll probably, if you come to one of those uh, classes, you'll you'll be able to meet other people who are already paid demon subscribers. Um I make usually brief remarks about uh, where we are in the testing cycle, and um, then the the class is largely Q and A. So you can come and um, ask me any question you want to ask me. Today on the show, uh, we had a lengthy email from uh, a U.S. Space Force member with lots of different issues to discuss. We had a personal statement from a uh, rabbi, Rabbi Ben. Thank you for submitting your personal statement for the uh, wood chipper. And we have a logical reasoning uh, question. Turns out to be one of these uh, evaluate the argument questions, which is not actually a question type. All right. Want to dive on in? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. First thing on the agenda today, we have uh, a lengthy email, might even say a wall of text. Uh, from, we're going to anonymize this somewhat, and I think we'll just call him, uh, staff sergeant. Okay. Uh, Staff sergeant. Staff sergeant. You want to, you want to read it? All right. So (laughs) this is the email you're claiming that it was sent to you in blue font. It was sent in blue font. It had lots of, as you can tell, it has bold, it has larger font, in some places, it has an actual bigger font. Yeah. It has all caps in two yep. different sizes of font at the very end. It has bold, it has asterisks, it has hashtags, it has ellipses, it has multiple PSs. It's yeah, a what are the backs what are the backslashes? I have I think he's he was I think his intent was to divide this up into several different email questions but i figure we just tackle it all at once sure let's do it okay i will try to read it (laughs) in the tone that it was sent (laughs) okay (laughs) okay so this this first this has been reading the fonts reading (laughs) the the bolds and reading the the larger font that we start off with here yeah 77 episodes period 5,727 minutes, period, parentheses. Not including every single LSAT Demon Daily episode, period. Speaking of which, where did Ben go? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so yeah, I have dropped off the LSAT Demon Daily a little bit. Not that much. I think you're still on half the episodes. Yeah, we just gave more room for our awesome demon teachers yeah and there's going to be more of that in to come i mean ideally they're going to be carrying a lot of that load um it's it's a turns out to be a lot of work to do five episodes a week and uh so yeah we're going to let the team do a lot of those episodes sometimes it's just totally more appropriate it'll be a question specifically about admissions or whatever like about applications themselves and it's like, well, I'm not the expert on that. Like, why, how about our team who just got admitted to Harvard or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> like they, yeah, they, they went probably, through the... <laughs> they just sent in 30 applications. Like, how about them? They, I should shut up, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's where Ben went. As far as 77 episodes, 5,727 minutes, I think that's about third place right now of all of the yeah. um, submissions. Last episode, we had... Uh, couple people that were over 6,000 minutes, but still pretty, pretty good job there. Yep. I have a 6,200 in my head. I don't know if that is. 6,200 is currently on the gold medal podium. Yeah. Okay. Not too late to be knocked off, but um, yeah, 5727 is bronze at best. Okay. So this correspondent continues. 
I did the math for you, semicolon, 5,727 minutes is 95.45 hours or 3.977 days. You may not know me, but I've spent over four days of my life listening to you. Wow, that's weird. Ellipses. Ellipses. <laughs> okay, quick question. Why doesn't everyone set their goal to 180? It doesn't make sense not to try to be perfect. Mm, okay, I have qualms with that already, but especially for lawyers. Lawyers aren't allowed to get it wrong. I think the sooner someone realizes that, the better. So why not start on the LSAT? Keep crushing it. Oh, there was two spaces after that sentence and yeah. one after the next. Say thanks to Ben for me too. Also, still working on the outer space intelligence analyst personal statement, period. Okay, so I guess that's our first question. Why don't people set their goal to 180? Because that's dumb. Uh, 174 is 99th percentile. One out of 100 people are going to reach 175 or 174, 175. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, 173, I think, is actually still 99th percentile. But anyways, yeah. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. It's, I think it's fluctuated on recent tests. But sure. Point oh, is, yeah. it's an elite score that like only exceptional people should... 180 is... 99.99th percentile. I mean, that's got to be a one out of, it's not a one out of a thousand. I think it's more like a one out of 10,000. Yep. And so it's a dumb goal. It's also wholly unnecessary. Um, 170 anything really is the same as a 180, especially 175 or higher is the same as a 180. Yeah. Once you get above the 75th percentile for every school on the planet, yeah, which um, what Yale LSAT is one... score is only pulling them up. Yeah, right. Yale's one seventy six. Uh, I thought it was one seventy five, but maybe it's one seventy six okay. now with all those high LSAT scores. Yeah, it could be in. easily one seventy six these days. Uh, you know, I get the sentiment of like why I agree. Why would you set a lower target goal? But I think why would you set a target score goal at all? I mean, we don't. That's just not what we do, right? When you yeah, log I mean, to the I demon, think there... it doesn't say what score would you like to achieve. That's Khan Academy. Yeah. I think <laughs> I think specific goals are not helpful. I do think we have a general view that you should be aiming to get above, ideally, 165, right? Well, you should get the score that's going to get you a full ride to the school you want to go to. Yep. And for most people, that's not anywhere close to 180. In fact, yep. for zero people, is it exactly 180? Like, nobody needs 180 to get a full ride. Yeah. Wherever they want to go. I mean, it, if you want to go to Michigan, you know, you, you do not need a 180 to get a full ride to Michigan. Also, I'm not sure that there is any good psychological benefit to shooting for 180. It's kind of no. like going to the gym and saying, hey, I want to get stronger. So I'm going to start lifting weights. And your trainer comes up to you and says, well, uh, Olympians these days are squatting X. <laughs> Let's make that our goal and get going. It's like, huh? It's so, I don't know. It's just not where you need to be today. Today, you need to be stronger than you were yesterday. If you're starting in the 140s, yeah. you need to get into the 150s. Your goals should be activity-oriented, not results-oriented anyway, right? I mean, yeah. you, you should set a goal of getting better every day. You should set yep. a goal of giving one high-quality hour of study every day. Yep. Yep. Um, arbitrarily setting your goal at 180 is a fantasy that almost nobody will actually reach. And it's just, yeah, that's not going to be helpful to you. That's going to be discouraging. It's like, you know, it's like saying you're going to be on the Supreme court or you're going to be president or whatever. It's like, okay, that's a, it, what it, it's just a fantasy. It's like, yeah, yeah. Okay. One out of every 10,000 of people who set that goal are actually going to do it. Yeah. So if that's your, I wouldn't even call it a goal. If that's your dream, well, you're allowed to fantasize about whatever you want to fantasize about. I just don't know that it's really that helpful to, you know, as far as like what you're going to do every day to actually give that any chance of happening. Yeah. Uh, why don't you skip this next short sure. parentheses? Because this is where he's just asking us to anonymize 
Uh, we're, we've anonymized as much as possible in this wall of text. We're, we're doing the best we can. All right, go ahead. Yep. He continues, when I first started studying for the LSAT, I thought it was hard. Now, the LSAT is fun, semicolon. I think it is easy, and I understand it for the most part, thanks to you, Ben, and your team. I'm currently getting 90% plus accuracy during practice tests and time sections. This puts me in the mid 160s. I'm not stopping until mid 170s with my eyes set on 180. Perfect or don't play. Just kidding. You got to start reading his per, his punctuation out loud. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, next paragraph. Because that I can was get... ellipses. Yeah. Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, I used to use ellipses all the time in mm. emails and casual writing and stuff. And I'm sure I sometimes still slip back into it. That's real lazy. You use a period or use anything else, but stop with the ellipses. Okay, go ahead. I can get over 90% of logical reasoning questions correct, given enough time. Uh, okay. Bad 100%. Comma. <laughs> yeah, comma. 100% of games, comma, and working on reading comprehension. <laughs> hey, that sentence ain't parallel, but um, no. I'm still not getting through the section in LR, however, <laughs> period. To get to 180, I will need to finish the section. Any advice on how to get there? Oh my God. I haven't taken the official LSAT yet, but I'm almost certain I'll receive accommodations when I do. <laughs> okay, well, that, that's going to help a lot, actually. Um, but... This is strange because uh, you're actually showing us why a specific and unnecessary goal of 180 is counterproductive because you're looking at what you would have to do to get that 180. Yeah, you would need to... Well, actually, you don't have to complete the sections. You can still get a 180 without completing one or two of the sections. But regardless, it's like getting you focused on the wrong things. Right? It's like, oh, an, an Olympian would have to pick up 10 plates. So how, how do I pick up 10 plates? Well, <laughs> you're not there yet. Yeah, you're asking the exact wrong question, which frankly is kind of shocking given someone who has listened to 5,727 minutes of the podcast this year. We How many of those 5,727 minutes were us talking about why you should never try to finish the sections. <laughs> All of them. Like, it seems like it's the only thing we talk about is that you need to slow the fuck down and get like work on your accuracy. Yeah. And, and this is just that typical student. Like it's no different from anybody else. You're in, you're wherever you are. He says he's in the mid one sixties. Okay. Well you need to get to the high one sixties before you can get to the low one seventies before you can get to the mid one seventies before you can get to your 180. Yeah. <laughs> and you're asking the exact wrong question, which is, you know, give me tips for how to finish. No, that's not what we do. Yeah, and you're you're getting 90% plus accuracy. We'll work on getting 100% accuracy on the ones you're doing, and you will find yourself getting better and naturally getting to more questions. Which we never stop saying. People think that our advice is going to change for them specifically. Oh, you're in a special situation. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Everybody thinks that they're special. That's true. Yeah. No, you're not. You're just, you're another LSAT student. We, and we are grateful that you're here, but it would, you know, be, it would, it would be in to your benefit to follow the advice that we have already given you. P.S. All right. This is our first P.S. I've used semicolons and M dashes in this email so Ben can tell me if I'm using them wrong. Hoping my privileges are not revoked. Fing <laughs> Hashtag fingers crossed. I actually don't remember the M dash, but... Um, no, yeah, he used them incorrectly, of course. Yep. <laughs> he, he, they're not even M dashes, and they have spaces around them. Yeah. So fucking stop it like everyone's privileges are revoked for all of these things and i don't it's just i don't understand why people think that they know how to do it when they clearly don't well actually what's what's odd about this question is that you're focusing on your semicolons and your m dashes but there's so much more in this email that's <laughs> distracting and wrong and like 
sentences that just kind of run on and <laughs> I don't know. I, I wouldn't worry about those things. Um, I would just worry, worry about shorter, clearer sentences and just not as many of them. This is a lot of well, unnecessary information. It, this is clearly just like he got to the end and he did the chef's kiss, like perfect send, like without <laughs> editing it, you know, and it became yeah. it, it became unreadable. Um, I mean, I actually I, I made a re reading error when I first read it because I fired back an email. Well, this is in response to his um, PSS. So okay. it, we're still on his PS, which is I've yep. used semicolons and M dashes. And yeah, we're both telling you that you should not do that. And which we've a said a thousand things. times. <laughs> And ellipses. Everybody's banned from ellipses from now on, too. Well, ellipses are terrible. That's not even, like, proper writing. I mean, that, you yeah. trail off into nothing. Like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get it. It's a it's an email. But y'all are trying to be lawyers. So, like, why not write professionally um, in this context? Okay, so the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the end of this PS says, Shit, I wrote this email and had another question. Okay. PSS. I have officiated high school sports for over a decade. I officiated basketball, baseball, softball, and volleyball. That was a clear sentence, by the way. Short, too. Yeah, thank you. Now I only officiate basketball. I feel like this is analogous to inter interpreting the law and what judges... <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Sorry. I feel like this is analogous to interpreting the law and what judges do. Absolutely okay. fucking not. Do you know what it's analogous to? It's analogous to what cops do. Yeah. You're yeah, on the basketball enforce. court. You're blowing the whistle in a fucking tenth of a second. Yep. You're not sitting there writing, researching, contemplating. <laughs> <laughs> this has nothing to do with that. The, <laughs> so... And lest you think I don't know anything about sports officiating, my dad was both a football and basketball official, and he is right now a golf official. And, I, you know, he I love my dad, and he, but he also thinks that he is, like, super judicious. And the truth is, he's, he's not. I, I remember talking with him about my 1L classes, and he, <laughs> I had a contracts class, and I was, like, showing him an example of what one of the, one of the uh, fact patterns was for the, for a brief or for an exam question or something like that. I was showing him the fact pattern so that I could explain to him that the answer was, you know, it's, it's unclear, it depends on this and this and this and this and this, and here's what the law says, and here's how that would apply, and it's this whole, like, complicated analysis, right? And I'll never forget it, because my dad, you know, the sports official guy, he, he was like, he, he knew the answer to the question. Mm. He just knew it. And he was fucking insistent. He was just like, nope, you signed a contract, so you have to, you have to do what the contract says. And it's like, uh, but do you remember when you signed the contract, <laughs> there was a gun at his head. <laughs> it's like, just anything, just any millions yeah. of other things. I was like, and I, 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 I was like have, trying to have an earnest conversation with him yeah. about what it's like to be a law student and what it's like to potentially be a lawyer someday. Yeah. And, I, and he, he was just like, he didn't even want to hear it because he already knew that the answer to the question was, you know, you have to put the roof on the house that you said you were going to put the roof on or whatever. <laughs> so I'm like, sorry, but that's not even part of the answer. Like, that's not even one tenth. That's not, it's just completely not what is done here. Well, you know what your, what your dad is doing there and what so many people do. And uh, we do it in politics. We do it all the time. It's like the actual nuance is too hard to deal with. So we zero in on one fact, yeah, right, right, and then we we put all our eggs in that basket. Not to mesh yeah. a bunch of analogies, but you know, people do it with uh, voting all the time too. They're like, oh, this person is uh, anti-abortion, so that's all that matters in my life, yeah. and that's what I'm going to vote for. No, that's like seems like <laughs> what ninety percent of the population is doing these days. It's just yeah. like whatever their one issue fact is, and that's the that's the answer. Yeah. And yeah, life is, and certainly legal matters are vastly more complicated than that. Um, there, there are no slam dunks, right? <laughs> it's like, no. if you're a decent lawyer at all, you're like, well, I think we have a good case here. <laughs> well, the other side's going to raise two or three points that like undercut that. And now you're not prepared at all to respond to them because you're like, well, well, but he signed the contract. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that ship has sailed. Yeah. Okay, so anyways, this correspondent continues. I read the rule book, apply the rules to dynamic events during the game, and calm, irate coaches when they act asterisks clearly, which bold. is in bold, 
asterisk, don't know the rules. <laughs> okay. He's officiating Sometimes... high school basketball <laughs> with some redneck high school basketball coaches who are probably like, you know, the physical education teacher or what. Nothing wrong yeah. with physical education teachers. I just, I literally grew up going to these games with my dad as the referee and I know exactly yeah. what he's doing, but it's, you're... You're trying, you're arguing with a, a someone who can only see one side. Like they, you know, mm -hmm. the coach is just yelling at you because they think it helps their team's chances of winning. They're not sure. there to like learn anything or like, oh, you're educating them on the rules. No, you're not. They don't give a fuck. They just want to yell at you because it might fire up their team or whatever. Mm. But this, <laughs> the fact that he's seeing himself, you know, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of somebody like a, a he says he sees himself as a Supreme Court justice here, like thoughtfully contemplating the basketball rule book, which is probably like 10 pages, you know, and he's <laughs> OK, it's 100 pages, whatever. Might be longer than the Constitution, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the Constitution comes along with like eight constitutional law books <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that yeah. come after it and the basketball rule book might have some decisions or something <laughs> but it, it's not come on dude all right go ahead <laughs> sorry he continues that's all right sometimes being a good official requires an understanding of the intent of the rule instead of the letter of the rule yeah do you think this is male Wait, the sentence what? says, I'll read it. It says, do okay. you think this is male, a personal statement over the Space Force? This is a better? I don't understand. It's clearly a typo and an autocorrect. Yeah. And he did not reread his shit before he sent it to us. Um, he's asking, should he write about being an official for high school sports instead of writing about yeah. being in the Space Force? Space Force. Um, I'm hesitant because I don't want it to seem like I'm naive comparing apples to oranges. Also, I'm moderately confident I will be one of the first applicants with Space Force experience since it's a new branch. The HLS and YLS's admission deans, okay, so referring to Harvard and Yale's admission deans, have said they want a class with each service branch represented. I'm their space for guy thoughts. <laughs> That's where I then misread his email, right? Because it's this big wall of text. Yeah. And I responded like, Hey, Hey man, I'm sorry, but I think we've missed. I, I never saw that. Cause he had teased. Remember on a previous episode, he had mm. teased that he was going to write it or no, maybe it was in class or it was in, must've been in class. He okay. teased that he was going to submit the, the, you know, can't wait, just wait till you read my space force personal statement. And, um, I said, you know, I said, great. Yeah. I'm excited to read that. And so when this email came in two months later, I was like, oh, we, oh, sorry. We must've missed your space force. Sorry. I, we, it didn't come in. Here's how you submit it. Mm -hmm. And then, then he responded and said, oh yeah, no, I haven't been working on that yet. Cause I've been working on the LSAT. Okay. I've been focusing on the LSAT, <laughs> but it's like, well, then why are you asking us all these questions about what you should write your personal statement about? We appreciate your questions. It's just, like, I don't know. Sometimes I don't, people make I don't it want, hard for us to help them. I don't know what you do at Space Force, but I, I imagine if it's hopefully like any other branch of the military, you have some serious responsibilities and hopefully you've executed them well. And I would imagine that's more interesting than officiating sports. So. Write about your job, not your hobby. Yeah high school sports officials get paid, you know, like you get paid $40 a game or whatever. It's not, it's not a job. It's a, you're doing it because you like doing it. You get some exercise, you get to yell at, you know, you get to have stupid people yell at you. You enjoy running around with the kids on the basketball court. That's great. That's all great. I, I respect that decision to do that, but I, I, I don't know. Maybe I know too much about it, but I, I just can't imagine, like, you going out of your way to stretch this hobby into, you know, now you're um, Justice Kennedy writing the deciding opinion <laughs> for the majority <laughs> is just, like, it's going to be obnoxious if that's what you try to write about. Yep. So, so 
don't, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right about your actual job, which is, if it's at the Space Force, then great. Okay. He says, sorry for the narrative. It's a slow day at work. All right. Next paragraph. Fuck everything. Ellipses. I'm sending this stupid email after this. I promise. Okay, period. Hopefully this isn't a painful email to read, but all caps, no, all caps, italics, burning question, half ellipses, two periods, <laughs> all caps, italics, and larger font, and bold, how did you and Ben meet? Question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> Yep. Uh, uh, ben and I met, I told this story at Ben's wedding recently. Uh, ben yep. and I met when he emailed me because he wanted to purchase some of my books. Uh, it, he, he emailed me complimenting me on my books and then immediately told me three things that were wrong with them. Uh, did you read that whole email at the <clears throat> wedding? I did. You read the things I said were wrong. <laughs> I, I think I, I just remember laughing. <laughs> I think I paraphrased them, <laughs> but uh, I looked yeah. over your shoulder and they looked kind of long. I was like, geez, that's kind of rude, but yeah, they were long. I read just like the header of each one of them. So that's how I met Ben was he, he yeah. complicated me with, uh, <laughs> <Compliculted. laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. no, it was, it was a uh, flattering that he wanted to, uh, it was flattering that he wanted to, uh, buy my books to use in his classes. And, so that's how we started talking. And then it was literally five days after that, that we had decided to start the Thinking LSAT podcast. That's crazy, man. And we did that just like on a lark. It was like, oh, let's give this a shot. And sure enough, it, you know, just like sort of took off and we're, what are we on today? 370, no, 329. 329. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so anyway, that's how we met. Uh, take away from all of this. Oh, but look at his signature. We got to look at his signature first because... It, now it's not blue anymore. Now it goes into the... It, it's not black either. It's like gray font. Dark gray, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it says respectfully... It, this is a to, It's a totally different font. It's not even the same... It's not the same... Uh, no, well, there's... there's Yeah, the respectfully... It's a serif font. Yeah. He, he wrote in a serif font, and then the signature is a sans serif font. If you're wondering what that is, by the way, a serif font has the little, like, ends on each letter... A sans serif means no serif. So it's like Arial. It just, there's no little wisps. The little the decorations on every letter. Yeah. Yeah. So that's gone now. And so, and then he uses a serif font for his address, but his, his name. His name is still in the sans serif font. And but it's different also. sizes. No, it gets bigger. It, yeah. His name gets bigger as the signature goes on. It's like. First name, middle initial, last name. So I would suggest toning that down. It's also italicized. It's also italicized. It's totally unprofessional. And it, then it says your name again after that anyway. Yeah, and title. the first letter of each word is in your name is bold, and the rest of the letters are not bold. It's too much. Well, it's like some. It, it's like you have an AOL account. I mean, it, it's it's like a... <laughs> It's something that you would have done in the on a Commodore 64 because it's cool to like play around with the different fonts and stuff. But these mm -hmm. days, nobody is amused uh, by that. Oh, it also has the uh, logo of um, the, uh, I guess that's a Space Force logo. Hey, by the way, we're redoing the thinkinglsat.com website. <laughs> cool. And uh, we were just having this conversation, not today, but yet, like two days ago. No, what was it? Anyways, whatever. We had three fonts, three different fonts for the entire <laughs> website. Oh. And it was like, we need to cut one of these. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right? And that was has, for the entire website. <laughs> he has probably 10 fonts for one email. Yeah. It's extra. Okay. It's, um, yeah, you, you need to... I would, I would, Ben, I think agrees. I would strongly uh, consider editing yourself and you got to tone down all of the fancy bullshit. Yep. 
It doesn't change the quality of the words. It, it, I it hope makes you it... knew what you were getting into when you sent this email after four days of straight listening to us. But... As much as he's listened to us, he must know what he was going to get. Yeah. And it's it's another one of these where it's like possibly trolling. I don't I'm not quite sure. Sure. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> anyway, good luck. Would love to, if you're brave enough to submit, would still love to read the uh, Space Force statement. Yep. Thanks for your support. Glad glad the demon's working for you. Sorry for busting balls. All right. Ready for, uh, we have the best personal statement that was submitted in the last couple of weeks uh, is from Rabbi Ben. Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll read it. Okay. Okay. Right off the bat. I am a rabbi and a PhD in Jewish philosophy. Capitalized there on philosophy? I was thinking the same thing. I don't think you need that. Not the P. You obviously Jewish, but not philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a rabbi and a PhD in Jewish philosophy, comma, with a thorough knowledge of the Jewish ethical, philosophical, and legal systems two spaces. I don't love that at least that last clause in the first sentence. Right. It's purely like an assertion that I just have to either believe or reject. You're just I have thorough knowledge. It's like Well I, I have to believe you. And also I don't know. You just actually, said that you're a PhD in Jewish philosophy. Yeah. That's a fact. Like you can show us documentation of that fact. As soon as you say you're a PhD in Jewish philosophy, I think we would presume that you have a knowledge of Jewish ethical, philosophical, and probably legal systems. You're not telling us anything that you didn't already tell us, and you're just burying, you know, if you want PhD in Jewish philosophy to be your primary focus, like that's, you know, if you want to know about me, I'm a PhD in Jewish philosophy. Yep. Now you're burying that. But instead you bury it with this conclusion where, yeah, a thorough knowledge of these things. And it's like, well, really, how thorough can it be? Yep. Now I'm questioning that. And by the way, here is a philosophical question for you. The more you know about a subject, (laughs) Mm. isn't it common for people to realize also at the same time how little they know? Yeah, right. That If that line would have said... I learn more about the, about these rich areas every day or something like that. Yeah. I I find that to be a lot more compelling of a message than I have a thorough knowledge. You're like declaring you already know everything. It seems like the more you know about Jewish ethical, philosophical, and legal systems, the more you realize you don't know. And the more you realize that there is so much nuance and maybe conflicting views out there and all that stuff. I learn like, new stuff about the LSAT all the time. Yeah. Like every class, I something comes up. I see a little different nuance in a question. A, a student brings up, a, asks a question, you know, a student's not understanding and I can't understand why they're not understanding. And then we work it out and then... I'm like, oh, I see. Okay, yeah. So this maybe is a little bit better way of thinking about it, or it's mm-hmm. like I'm I'm learning all the time about like a much narrower area. The LSAT isn't nearly as broad as Jewish philosophy, yeah. Right. So this is a very narrow area, and I've been doing it now for 15 years, and I still learn new shit all the time. So, okay. Anyway, um, you yeah. know, phone rings and we get interrupted. Yeah. Okay. I would say you're a religious person with a PhD. Yeah. And we, yeah. I mean, and, and if like, <clears throat> if PhD is the thing you really want to hang your hat on, then, you know, that's the, that's the fact we've learned, which you're is an academic. Okay. I mean, yeah. You're an academic. It. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's not a bad fact to lead. With. Nope. Nope. Okay. Oh, my dissertation. And then it's in quotation marks here, mm-hmm. which I'm not sure about the style, like, um, whatever, it's a fine point, but like, how should you reference your own publications? Do you, yeah. I I don't know. I mean, the caps are, are, it it also could possibly need an underline. Or italics. uh, Italics. Or italics, probably italics, right? Yeah. Instead of quotation marks? Maybe. It's an article. I don't know. It, but... I often question, uh, just stepping back, maybe this is helpful here, but I often question the need for including the title 
it's often the titles are often long. They're well, often kind of hard to follow. I, I'd much rather hear about your dissertation. Allow me to said. proceed because yeah. here's the title, right? Yeah. Like, how mm-hmm. much is the typical person who is not a PhD in Jewish philosophy going to get out of this title? Yep. Here's the title. My dissertation, comma, Messianism, Revelation, and the book, colon, I'm not, I'm going to botch all the pronunciations here, but Rebbe Naman of Breslov and the Torah of Atik. And then the sentence continues, but like, yeah, you're not getting any value out of quoting the name of your dissertation there. Because I got no fucking idea what that is even about. No, nope. I, I mean, it has something to do with the Messiah, but then I'm like, but in what way? I don't so, know. Yeah, I'm, so and then like, some oh, books that I've never heard of. You're yeah. really religious and you're really into religious books or something, right? It's like, I, I don't know. I have no idea what the, what you're writing about. I, I don't. I, so I, and yeah, I think omit the title would probably be a good edit here. Yep. Uh, anyway, that dissertation. So and like take out the title. My dissertation did a genre analysis of Rebbe Naaman. So you're going to say the guy's name again anyway. So what's the point of naming it in the title? Yep. My dissertation did a genre analysis, genre analysis of Rebbe Naaman of Breslov's magnum opus parentheses Likude Moharan end parentheses period. I honestly hate all of this because I just don't understand. I don't, you're, you're firing so many novel words at me yeah like what you did a genre analysis i understand those words yep but of someone from somewhere writing about it's you know and you even put the title of his book i don't care what's that have to do with you yeah i'd love to hear more i think you can just cut all uh, just cut all that which that's the thing is that you can make these pieces shine by just getting rid of shit. Like just yeah. literally just cut out parts, right? The yep. best editor that I ever had in journalism school, she would use a red pen and she would mark up our printed assignments and the best edits that she ever would give. And it was a miracle that she was able to do it. All she would put is a, a square bracket, op- to, like a square open bracket and then a square close bracket. Hmm. And that meant omit. And she would do that on your entire piece where she would write very few words. It would just be... Omit. <laughs> it would just, and like you would omit it all and it would have the exact same meaning except for just sound way, way better. Yep. So like, I don't know, man. That, the, that whole second sentence kind of seems like a just... Huh? Well, and you've mentioned this before too. I think you got it from Stephen King, but what is it? Is it kill your babies? Or oh, something? yeah. I, what, yeah. Is it, what is the phrase? I, that sounds horrible, but what I just said. No, that, that something, is, it's something like that. Yeah, kill your yeah. babies. It's just like, I know that you birthed that sentence. And you, you probably love the, all the words you put there. And, and you worked the, hard on it. It makes perfect yeah. sense to you. Yep. But you need to kill that baby because there's no one else who's reading this is going to have any idea what you're talking about. I mean, nope. maybe if you're applying to like a... Jewish law are there Jewish law schools like super focused on there's got to be one out there at least right I and there are of course there are but yeah I I'm not familiar with them really and if that's what this is for then okay maybe it's a different game but um most law schools are secular and nobody's gonna have any idea what you're talking about okay yeah I argued that the work is best understood not as a philosophical or theological work but in terms of the intended transformative power of the text on the reader and on the world. Cut Sorry, it. I, yeah, cut it. You have to I, cut it. I, I, I was quiet there for a half second because it's also not parallel. Like I argued that the work is best understood not as something, but oh, as something say, but else. As. Yeah, yeah. And so that like that alone, like it's like there's things in your writing. You also left a comma after your title. Uh, it just, it slows the reader down. It's like, ugh, yeah. what, are you, like, what are you trying to say? Yeah, shorten your sentences, but that whole sentence needs to be cut because this is like he's relaying his argument about a book that we don't know anything about. We have no... And knowledge. I don't care about it. 
Yeah. Why would I care about it? I'm not, I'm in, I'm wondering if you're going to kick ass in my law school. And so far you're not, you're not showing me that you're going to kick ass in my law school because you're basically rambling about something that's totally irrelevant to me. You know, yeah. like the fact that you made an argument. So like, I guess you're wanting to, you're, you're, you're like, so it's, it's not just your PhD now, but it's your dissertation and you're really yeah. wanting to talk about your dissertation but I don't know that your dissertation is the best thing that you could be talking about here, especially because it's incomprehensible to the reader. Yep. You know, it's like, I'm walking away from this, like, Oh man, I've been going around thinking that Rebbe Naman's liquid moron is best understood as a philosophical or theological work. But as it turns out, it's actually, you know, not one reader is going to have that response where they're like, Oh, that's a valuable bit of information. Okay, second paragraph. <laughs> Over my 15 years as a rabbi, I have discovered a particular skill in Jewish law, parentheses, halacha. You've discovered a particular skill? Like, you're saying you have this skill? Again, that's just a conclusion that I now have to either accept or reject. Yeah, and it's another word that we don't understand, which doesn't help anything. This... And, and this uh, whole statement is just like stuffed with these, you know, Jewish words. Um, or is it, is it Yiddish? Forgive my ignorance. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, but all I know is it's a whole bunch of words that I don't know what they are. Yep. Um, so if you're applying again, this goes back to, if you're applying to a Jewish law school, maybe this would have a more receptive audience, but I think anywhere else it's going to be rough. For the past seven years, I have been a faculty member of the A-L-E-P-H Ordination Program. Okay. Don't know what that is. That's an acronym. Or it's not... Isn't it an ac Yes, it's an acronym. I mean, maybe they say it as an initialism. Sorry, it's an initialism. Yeah, yeah it's an initialism. Well, okay. they could say Aleph. Uh, we have no Aleph. idea. Okay. It's a bunch of letters, and we have no idea what they stand for. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So for the past seven years, I have been a faculty member of this ordination program. I teach rabbinical students different theoretical approaches to Jewish law and help them develop their own Jewish legal voice, advocating effectively for positions they believe in based on sources from the Jewish tradition. What? <laughs> I am so lost. I don't know advocating effectively for positions they believe in in class in their religious communities at church in the world like as political activists okay if that's the case do you have an example of someone who's done this even then it's about someone else i want to know about you i teach students to quote turn it over and turn it over end quote comma to see multiple aspects of every issue and to understand how they can support different legal positions through their interpretation of key texts. Okay, so he's a professor. He teaches people whatever. I don't like that quote very much because I don't know if you're quoting yourself, which would be obnoxious, or you're quoting some other like wisdom that I'm not familiar with. I think you just kill the quotation marks around turn it over and turn it over. But, you know, the, the, the thing he's trying to relay is he, he teaches people to how to think in a Jewish law context. My students have yeah. expressed appreciation in particular for my rigorous teaching, colon. I train my students to be careful and creative interpreters of the Jewish legal tradition. I'm still confused as to what context his students are operating in. So they can support different legal positions through their interpretations of their interpretation of key texts. Who's going to be persuaded by those key texts except for people who believe in them? Well, that's the context in which he's operating. I mean, he he's a he's a PhD, he's a professor in Jewish law, which is a religious thing. Like it doesn't it's not like the law. It's Jewish law. So it's within the I imagine it's like within the Jewish. So this is like this is like religious debate 
between fellow practitioners. Yeah, I think the law is this. I think we should do whatever we yeah. are supposed to do. Sounds to okay. me like he's yeah, he's training people to go out and make these arguments within some kind of like a Jewish temple court system, I guess. Okay. I think you could explain all this stuff to people who don't know, like most of your readers aren't going to have any idea what you're talking about here. So I, I don't know. It seems like you need to, I think it's exactly what you were talking about, Ben. He's such an expert in this area, or it's actually not what you were talking about. It's what I thought you were going to talk about. What I thought you were going to talk about is that we as experts frequently get blinded to the fact that nobody else has any of the background knowledge that we have. Mm. And I think that's what's happening here is that he he's just assuming that everybody knows kind of the context. Like he, he doesn't realize how ignorant the most readers are going to be of this world. Yep. And so he's not expl- he's not giving enough details about what's actually happening here for mm-hmm. us to really know what's going on. Yep. OK, um, much of my teaching focuses on contemporary issues such as environmentalism, ethical consumption and the like. Bringing <laughs> traditional legal texts to bear on these topics in relevant and compelling ways. Traditional legal texts. I assume he means traditional Jewish legal texts. I guess so. Because he's not a law professor. He's applying to law school. I mean, he's a Jewish law professor, so that must be what he means. Sorry, you were going to be puzzled about something else. What's well, I don't love the and the like it's like super conversational oh i do this this and the like like huh uh i don't know what else well you already said (laughs) such as yeah and then again this i hate this sentence because it's a conclusion i i i i I, I bring you know these traditional legal texts to bear on these topics in and this is where you get conclusatory relevant in compelling ways Okay, you're telling me that they're relevant. You're telling me that they're compelling. I just have to sit here and nod my head and believe you. Be like, oh, wow, you must... It's so great that you're on point and you're compelling. Yeah. In addition, I find and teach ways the Jewish tradition has brought humanity, compassion, and the quest for peace into the law. The Jewish law or just law, period? Unclear. Okay. Okay. That does make it sound, though, like we misinterpreted above, because there it sounds like he's, it's separate, like he's, this is the Jewish tradition, and they have been fighting for these compassionate changes to the laws of the United States or your states or whatever. I don't know. Hmm. Okay. Two years ago, I founded Kol Halev, a 501c3 nonprofit. I serve, I I like that sentence because it's just factual and without any of those grand conclusions in it. Nope. It's not, it's not like I'm like doubting this, but it's a very powerful fact. It's like I started a 501 C three. Okay, great. I serve as the president and executive director and oversee all administration. As part of my work with Cole Halev, I run the Jewish virtual Academy, a virtual school focusing largely on Jewish ethics. Couple things you don't need to capitalize president and executive director. Right. You also have done this a couple times. You said I serve as the president and executive director, and, and then you do comma, and then you say and oversee all administration. That's I don't know what it's called. I don't know if it's a comma splice or whatever. But you're you're you have an independent clause and then you have a dependent clause. You don't want to separate them with a comma. You need to get rid of that comma. Or you add I. Or um, you add I after it and make it independent so that you can separate those two clauses with a comma. I think Abigail finally taught me the rule, which is um, if you're going to have a comma, then the the next thing needs to have its own uh, subject. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah, unless it's so, a list, but that's... Right, unless we don't have a list. Thing. The, yeah. This thing that we're talking about here, you don't... It, otherwise, just omit the comma. Yep. Uh, okay. Two paragraphs left in one of my classes, quote, Torah and today. I don't, I don't know about the quotations and the capitals. I I think, I don't know. It just seems strange to me. Yep. Um, probably just caps there. Yeah. 
I teach students to apply texts from the Jewish legal tradition to contemporary situations, such as socially responsible investing, gun control, and immigration. In the unit on gun control, for example, we are exploring different Talmudic ru uh, rulings on self-defense and looking in fine detail at specific details. Hmm, that's clunky writing there. Just You don't yeah. need to say detail twice like that. Um, you could probably say, and looking in fine detail at specifics, such as how certain one has to be that the person is actually intending to kill. While these texts have obvious implications for contemporary events, the answer is less central than the process. And here, this bumped me a lot when I read it the first time. This bumped me mm. a lot. Okay. Maybe it's just my bad. I, he goes, I am teaching middle school students. And I was like, whoa, what? Middle school students? Oh, this whole time, I thought you were a college professor. Exactly. Okay, so it's not just me. It's you too. Yep. Yep. So what he's talking about there is his nonprofit where he teaches middle school students. Okay. That's but we fair. forgot about his nonprofit because we see him as this professor, like a PhD yeah. professor teaching these rabbinical students. And all this stuff, when you're talking about like applying Jewish text from Jewish legal tradition to contemporary situations like socially responsible investing and gun control and immigration, then all of a sudden it's like a big letdown to hear middle school students. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, I thought you were doing this at a much higher level than what, like, not that te not that there's anything wrong with teaching middle, middle school students, but I was seeing you as like this kind of like a law professor. And now I'm seeing you as like a grade school teacher or middle school yeah. teacher. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. So that did kind of, anyway, I'm teaching them, the middle school students to approach questions systematically, comma, to break them down into specific ethical questions, comma, and to construct a shita, parentheses, legal theory, to base their opinion on. There should probably be shitas and opinions, uh, plural, right? Because mm -hmm. it was students, it was ethical questions. S, yeah, questions. I yep. think that last bit of that list should be pluralized plural. in order yep. to be parallel. I also teach them to verbalize their own ethical intuitions and understand the ethical intuitions of the texts we study. So there's a missing that right here. So that they can make a reasoned decision. In other words, I'm teaching them to be self-reflective ethical thinkers. Conclusion. Too much of this is conclusatory. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, cut half of this and put in more facts. Yep. You know, it, it's also like, it's it's a very, it's all like real high, it's all real lofty and, and not enough like... Concrete details. Yeah, like, like what? Can we have an example? Or can we like, can you talk about a situation that actually happened in your classroom? Or it, there's, it's weirdly like not human, I guess. Um, yep. You agree? Yeah. Oh, 100%. Look, we're talking about middle school students, right? And supposedly we're covering everything from responsible investing, gun control, and immigration to who knows what, because those are just some examples. And it's like, uh, you could talk for <laughs> months on any one of these topics, and now I just feel like you're kind of trying to throw everything <laughs> in, and it makes me feel like nothing's there. I'm not saying nothing's there. I'm just saying when people do this, my sense is uh, there's actually nothing to talk about. And so you just go super high level and keep it vague. Yeah, it's like a resume that has, you know, three pages and it's just bullets after bullets after bullets after bullets. And it's like becomes it's like too much uh, where it's like you don't even get anything out of it. Mm hmm. Last paragraph. I have come to perceive that as a rabbi, I have been standing on the sideline of history. Okay, so now this I put, this I hate. This is a direct violation of one of our commandments um, that we published a while back about things to do and not do in your personal statement. But you know, shitting on your own job is just not something that needs to be in your personal statement for law school. Yeah. Like. I want you to be like a badass. I, I want I want I want to be like, oh man, this guy's like totally killing it as a rabbi and you know wants to 
bless us with his presence at our law school, we, we should admit him. Mm-hmm. And instead, you're like, well, actually, I'm not happy being a rabbi because I'm standing on the sideline of history. Yep. Which is like, wah, wah, just this like bummer. But you're shitting on your profession. You're also exactly. shitting on yourself. I'm, I haven't done anything. No. Okay. Yeah. I, <laughs> I didn't even think about shitting on the broader thing of like, <sighs> you just insulted all rabbis. Like you just yeah. told all rabbis that they're standing on the sideline of history. But you, the part that, that I care about more is you insulted your own resume. Yep. Like you just now, oh, okay. So maybe it's not that big of a deal that he's a rabbi and does all this work. Yep. I am pursuing a legal career as a way not just to teach a vision of a caring society, because that's what you do now, I guess, but to advocate for and implement such a vision. Which sounds naive, no offense, but so many people say that they're applying to law school to change the world, and it's like, well, what do I, as an admissions officer, think you're actually going to do? You're going to come here... You're going to go work for a law firm and no one's ever going to know you existed. No offense, but that's <laughs> no the offense. story for 99.9% of the world is we do our thing and no one knows. Yeah, there, there, are, there are mountains of applications that think that they're going to implement a vision of society. Everybody thinks they're going to implement a vision of society. Yeah. And it's just not what lawyers do. Like, who's going to pay you to implement this vision? Even think about, like, presidents of the United States. How much of their vision gets actually adopted by the United States in the world? Sometimes it does for a season, and then it gets washed away. No no matter how much you hate or love Obama, what did he actually accomplish? No matter how much you hate or love Trump, how much did he actually accomplish? And that's the president yeah. of the goddamn United States. Yeah. It's this, it is, it's this, uh, for me, this statement is too lofty. It's just like yep. head in the clouds and not enough. Like I'm not getting any kind of a picture of what you will actually do as a lawyer. Lawyers aren't teachers. Lawyers have a client that they want to go win a case for. Yep. Or they work on deals or they, you know, like gosh, a lot of stuff that lawyers do, but implementing a vision of society is a unlikely one. Yep. Being a lawyer is for me, which you're not qualified to, you're not qualified to say whatever you're about to say because you've never been a lawyer, <laughs> <laughs> right? But, it's your perception of what a yeah, lawyer does. Yeah. Right. Well, no, that, and you can have, sure, you have a perception, but you are you don't have any authority to say what lawyers do, or at least you haven't conveyed any ability, you haven't conveyed any, like, why should I believe you? Yeah. With your opinion of what a lawyer would do. But anyway, being a lawyer is, for me, an opportunity to put into practice the biblical prophet Micah's injunction, colon, quotation mark, do justice, Love goodness and walk humbly with your God. End quote. Parentheses, Micah 6, 8. I think that's the first biblical quote that we've ever seen in a personal statement. It's the first one that we've ever seen. No, I bet we have. I have this really? feeling that sometime in the last three years, we've <laughs> seen someone drop yeah, something. True. Our memories are definitely faulty. Um, it's the first one that I recall. Um, uh, that might that might land on some desk of some Jewish law school <laughs> and work well. I can't see it working well at most law schools. Well, like, there are... I really don't want to hear like your your thoughts on the the Bible. That's just like a lightning rod. There are religious people at every school, uh, and certainly you might get a reader who's like, "Oh wow, you know, this is a man of God. We 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 like that." That's certainly possible, but I would also think that you're going to have many readers who are going to respond exactly opposite, depending on where you're applying. But I mean, there are plenty of secular folks, there's plenty of atheists around. Or just, you don't even have to be atheist. You can just be like, I'm not interested in religion, and why are you shoving this in my face? You could be agnostic, you could be religious, but not want, you, you, you could be a Protestant, you could be a Catholic, you could be a whatever, and you could just be like, huh? 
quoting scripture at me. I mean, it, it's, a, you know, it's hey, justice and goodness and humility. Those are all good things. Don't get us wrong. I don't know. I, to me, I guess the, the, the like naivety of it is the biggest problem. The problem is, well, I mean, let's just even talk about the merits of the claim, right? Do justice, love goodness, and walk humbly with your God. Um, what does it mean to do justice? Like, that itself is just vague, and it's it's the very reason that we have a lot of problems in the world today is because different definitions of justice leave different lead different cultural groups yeah. to fight with each other. Well, there, there was an earlier it's, thing, Ben. So um, earlier on... He yeah. said specifically, I almost made a comment of it, a comment on it. He said, I teach students to turn it over and over to see multiple aspects, which is, sounds good. Then he goes, and to understand how they can support different legal positions through their interpretation of key texts. Wait, that's not actually the quote. It's similar. But there's another one that was even more... Oh, there it is. It was right before that. I teach rabbinical students how to blah, 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 and advocate effectively for positions they believe in based on sources from the Jewish tradition. Yeah, that's... My objection to that is, wait, so you made up your mind first and then you went looking for justification in the text? Because that's sure. what that sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that uh, I guess that's what lawyers do. <laughs> like, you know, because they, it's not like they like want their client to get convicted or whatever. So they're gonna, they're gonna they're gonna develop a theory that the client is not guilty, and then they're gonna go try to find evidence that supports that claim. But it doesn't seem academic to me. I guess is my real objection. Like, it doesn't sound like science. It sounds like uh, you know, arrive at your conclusion first. And then go cherry pick whatever evidence you need to support that conclusion. Well, I think that's 100% what law school is, right? We're teaching you how to argue for po your position, whatever position that might be. And how are we going to do that? We're going to show you how there's multiple sides to an but issue. But you don't get to pick the, the side. <laughs> that's the thing is that you, you have to be able to make that argument from both sides. Yeah, exactly. And, and we're training you to argue, you know, become an effective advocate, <laughs> which means... Um, yeah, I think law school openly admits there's not necessarily even a right or wrong answer in a lot of cases. But something about, like, the problem with religion is there's this sense of moral superiority combined with, like, now these tactics to argue for what you view is, I don't know. Deciding just, that gays are bad and then going and looking in the Bible and finding something that doesn't even say that gays are bad, but it just, like, they, you're going to shoehorn in your religious conclusion that homosexuality yeah. is or, against or, the yeah. Bible. I mean, you, you can have a hundred different examples. It's just like... Abortion <laughs> or any other thing. Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's just a light... <laughs> Religion it is a lightning, is a lightning rod. rod. Yeah, and, and so I don't know. Hate mail. <laughs> just because we brought it up, just because we talked about it, we're yeah, we're talking about it, people are like, can. oh, it sounds like what you're saying is it, blah blah blah, right? And it's like, okay, well, all I'm saying is, I guess you just proved my point. So I would not write about this. I don't know where you're applying to law school though. Okay, it sounds like that was Ben's <laughs> final thoughts. <laughs> um, <laughs> my final thought would be, uh, you're a teacher and you're an administrator. And I would like to know more about the practical and a rabbi. And I would like to know more um, like I would like to have finer detail of other like your students and one issue, not a list of a million different issues, you know, where you also say and the like you know, such as blah, 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 and the like. It's like, okay, well, can we just focus on one of them so that we can, because, you know, this is from Rabbi Ben, but I, I, I sometimes personal statements, I walk away from them going, well, but where is, where is Rabbi Ben in this? Yeah. It's a lot of grandiose conclusions about Jewish philosophy or, or, or like, you're making a lot of conclusions about the things that you teach your students to do, but I'm not actually seeing you teach a student to do those things. If that makes sense.
Yeah, totally. Too high level. Too high level. Uh, that that is yeah. That that would be my final words. All right. All we have left is a uh, logical reasoning question. Uh, this is from test seventy three, section two. It's question number twenty five. I wonder if we're running out of these questions that we can talk about on the show. We've been hmm. at it for a while. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll read, and I'm not going to do any analysis. Only Ben. <laughs> Student says. Before completing my research paper, I want to find the book from which I copied a passage to quote in the paper. Okay, you're about to finish. This person is writing a research paper. They're not done, and apparently they copied a passage from some book, and they want to figure out what that book was. They forgot what book it was. Got it. They better they better go find it, right? Yep. Okay, well, they want to the quote book, Yeah. Without the book, I will be unable to write an accurate citation. Okay. That's great. I'm glad you paused there. Um, But I think I understand it. You need that book to correctly cite it. And without an accurate citation, I will be unable to include the quotation. Mm, Okay. So you need the book to cite it and you need the citation to include the quote. So right now, I'm putting this all together. If you don't get that book, you're not going to be able to include the quotation that you found. Hence, since the completed paper will be much better with the quotation than without, comma, and then there's a blank. (laughs) And the question says, which one of the following most logically completes the student's argument? Now, I appreciate you reading that question, but I actually didn't need you to read that question as soon as i saw that blank yeah i'm like wanting to just finish the the sentence for (laughs) for you right and it's like since the completed paper will be much better with that with the quotation than without it i better damn well find that book that's essentially what this person is trying to say yeah like i really better i want to find the damn book yeah yep perfect Mm -hmm. perfect Okay, so now we just need to find that. A says, I will have to include an inaccurate citation. Nope. Why, though? I mean, there's no there's no discussion of like, oh, what are my alternatives? If I can't find the book, I'm just going to go ahead and lie. Like, there was no mention of that. Yeah, there's no so. evidence <laughs> supporting the idea that this student wants to plagiarize. Yep. Or include and make up a citation or whatever. Like there's no evidence that the student is wanting to do that. Yep. B, I will be unable to complete my research paper. Again, no. Um, We know that the paper won't be as good without the quotation, um, but you can still finish it. Just won't be as good. C says, if I do not find the book, my research paper will suffer. True. I mean... I was looking, I'm looking for something that's like, hey, I I should find that book or I want to find that book. But this is also factually true. If you don't find it, your paper will suffer. Um, In some ways, this is actually a safer claim than what I said. So I would keep this open. I like that. Yeah. So you like it that it's safe. But can we talk a little bit about the question type here? Sure. It says, which one of the following most logically completes the student's argument? Um... We're looking for the thing that best fills in that blank spot. These answers tend to be, I mean, this is a must be true question. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, it's so other prep companies, you, you might, and even the law school admission council themselves, they might call this like a complete the argument question, mm-hmm. but it's really not because, or it's not helpful to think of it as a complete the argument question because Half the time, they're going to be looking for a premise, and then half the time, they're going to be looking for a conclusion or something that must be true. Mm -hmm. So if it says since or because or for right before the blank, then they would be looking for something that will bolster the argument. They're like looking for you to fill in the blank with something that isn't in the evidence. But if if it were added to the evidence, it would help the argument. Yeah. And here, they, the blank is following a hence. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, it says hence, and then it has a comma clause that has a premise in it, right? Hence, yep. since, it provides this additional premise. 
and but then another comma and then the blank. And so what they're really looking for here is something that must be true based on what the student has already said. Yep. And so we're going to classify this as a must be true question. You, this is the rare question type where you can't actually tell what type of question it is by looking at the uh, question. You can't. They can use this exact same stem on a strengthen question. Oh, oh, oh. I For a half second there, I thought you were referring to the passage. But no, no, yes, no. I know. I agree 100%. It's like yeah. I knew that we were looking for what must be true from the passage yep. because the blank was a conclusion. Yep. Yeah. So, th so this is, I mean, it's yet another example of why looking at the question stem or the, sorry, the question before reading the passage is dumb. Totally. Because here you'd be like, okay, I got to fill the blank in, which by the way is obvious because there's a blank in the passage. No shit. And it, you can't tell what type of blank you're filling in until you actually read yeah, the passage. It could be a must be true or it could be a strengthen. And those are vastly yep. different question types. And even yep. for somebody who thinks like, you know, that, that method the that Kaplan or whatever teaches is read the question first and then decide whether this is a type of question that you want to do. <laughs> well, you don't know whether it's a strengthen question or a must be true question. And maybe you're good at must be trues, but you suck at strengthen. So how yeah. then how does that technique technique? I'm just very generous use of that. Okay. How does that <laughs> bad technique, um, you know, help you? It can't. Yeah. All yeah. right. Anyway, you like C. C again said, if I do not find the book, my research paper will suffer. And you, it feels I like safe. that because that is true, right? Like yeah. I know that to be true on the basis of the information provided. Right. Since the completed paper will be much better with the quotation than without, yes, 100%. If I do not find the book, my research paper will suffer. Um, so I'm, I mean, at this point, now that we've talked about it so much, I almost feel like this has to be the answer, but yeah. um, it's let's see it's what just, else there is. <laughs> well, the first thing you said, the one, you, one word, for your first yeah. response to C was true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, okay. It's a must be true question. And you're yeah. like, well, that's true. Okay. Yeah. Right, well, that's probably the answer. D, yeah. if I do not find the book, I will include the quotation without an accurate citation. Okay. Um, you could, this, <laughs> this person certainly could do that, but there's no evidence up to this point that suggests that this person is going to go ahead and lie, as we yeah. talked about when we wrote or looked at answer choice A. Yeah, and if you were going to pick D, then how do you not pick A? And if you were going to pick A, then how do you not pick D? Yep. I mean, mm -hmm. those two are like basically identical in meaning that you're going to miscite it. Yep. Um, or include the quote without a citation, I mean, which is the to be the fair, thing. D is better than A because it accounts for not finding the book, whereas A requires us to assume. Oh, A is like A. also I'm not even going to look for the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But okay. still, they, they both suck. They both suck. E, if I do not find the book, I will be unable to complete my research paper. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's, okay. This is the mirror to, to B. But um, it's better than B because it says, look, I actually didn't find the book. If I didn't find it, then I'll be unable to complete my research paper. No. All we know so far is that it will be a worse research paper without the quotation. And that's exactly what C said. So C is the answer. So sees the answer because this turns out to be a must be true question and they wanted you to conservatively, when they say which one of the following most logically completes the argument, uh, if, if the blank is following a hence or anything that indicates that this should be a conclusion, then we can't put anything new into the, into that spot. We have to put something that's based in the evidence and here sees the only one that's based in the evidence. Yeah, I want to actually ha hammer that home a little bit more. I think people might, maybe when they're new to the test, get thrown off by the phrase most in that question. Like, which one I find most logically? It's like, the more logical something gets, <laughs> the closer it's actually going to get to the original content. Like, yeah, I almost feel like people might be like reaching out. They're like, oh, which one is the most? Oh, it's going to go out right, there. They see that most and they're like, oh, so I need an answer that's like extra. But no, yeah. it's... They all they meant was which one is the safest logical mm -hmm. completion of what they were saying there. Yep. All right. Um, so that's that. Uh, you can be LSAT famous. Get on an upcoming show by emailing help at thinkinglsat.com. If you have questions about the LSAT demon, we have the best customer service team in the world. They are at help at lsatdemon.com and they will sort you out um, immediately. Check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. We've been putting out five episodes a week. There's already uh, over 100 of those episodes to binge if you're so inclined. Uh, 
That was episode 329 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.